Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, this evening, uh, Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jenny Morgan. I'm the interim dean of the law school. I'm the dean while they're searching uh, far and wide for a dean to take the job on permanently. I'm what is known as a safe pair of hands. Um, but I'm really, really pleased to be here tonight um, to welcome you all to the lecture. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our guest speaker, who I'll introduce formally in a moment. Um, and tonight's session is actually being live streamed to Perth, so welcome to the people in Perth as well. Um, I would like to acknowledge Tuan Nguyen and Daniel Nguyen um, from the Asian Australian Lawyers Association who have been instrumental in putting this together. Um, and it's great to be uh, hosting it with them tonight. Uh, Daniel will chair the question time at the end, and Zubair, the president of the Victorian branch of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, will give the, the final closing. Uh, so it's terrific to have them there. I'd also like to formally acknowledge uh, that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to acknowledge their elders, uh, both past and present. Um, I also have some uh, much less erudite but practical matters to mention to you. Um, the session tonight is being videoed. Um, and there is also a photographer who will be wandering around taking photos. If you don't want to have your photos taken, please tell uh, the organisers that you don't and will ensure that they're not used in any way. Um, and the, the usual reminder, and I did do my own, uh, to make sure your phones are on silent. Um, I, I'm, I'm dreading the day when I make that reminder and then my phone rings. Um, it's now my great pleasure to formally introduce tonight's speaker. And I just want to say a few brief words um, before I invite him to deliver this evening's lecture. Um, uh, Frank Wu is currently a distinguished professor at the University of California Hastings College of Law. He previously, previously served as Chancellor and Dean. Um, he told me he'd been the Dean twice. Um, we were commiserating. Um, and he's been voted the most influential dean in legal education in a poll by National Jurist magazine. Before joining um, UC Hastings, he was a member of the faculty at Howard University, served as dean of Wayne State, he really has done a lot. Um, and he's been a visiting professor at the University of Michigan, an adjunct professor at Columbia, and a Thomas C. Gray teaching fellow at Stanford. And he also taught at the Peking University School of Transnational Law in its inaugural year. He's very uh, involved in uh, civic causes, civic engagement and volunteer service and in April 2016 he was elected by the members of the Committee of 100 as their chair. The Committee of 100 is a non-profit membership organisation that invites Chinese Americans who have achieved the highest levels of success to join, working on twin missions of promoting good relations between the US and China and the civic engagement of Chinese Americans. We're really, really pleased that uh, Frank's joined us tonight and has agreed to share his absolute vast wealth of knowledge um, on Asian immigration, multiculturalism, and how democracy and diversity can work together. So, welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. Good evening, friends. It's wonderful to be back here in Australia. I last visited in uh, your bicentennial in 1988, so it's been a while. I hope uh, I'm invited to return before another three decades pass. <laughs> Let me begin at the beginning. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story that I hope will inspire you to share your stories, a story that I hope will have some common themes with your experiences, whether you are Asian, Australian, whoever you are, whatever your heritage, ancestry, identity, 
because it is through sharing our stories, the dialogue, that we drive forward a diverse democracy. So I'm Asian American, but my parents were neither. They weren't Asian, nor were they American. I would go so far as to say that in Asia, there are few, if any, Asians. Now, when I say that, that claim initially sounds absurd, but it's no different than the proposition that there are very few Europeans in Europe. What I mean by that is, in Asia, they don't have a sense of pan-Asian identity. If you're familiar at all with Asia, if you've lived there, traveled there, or if you've studied Asia at all, you realize that the notion of Asia is really much more of a Western construct, or it's associated with imperialism or uh, idealism. No, in Asia, people identify as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese. They're Indian, they're Pakistani, they're Filipino, they're Cambodian. They identify much more specifically by an organic ethnic nationalism. They don't declare themselves, by and large, to be Asians. And even more than that, once you travel and visit, you realize there's no love lost. The Chinese don't like the Japanese, the Japanese don't like the Koreans, and on and on and on. Even though in the West, we are told, as I was when I was a kid growing up, well, you all look the same. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, when you're one of them inside uh, a nation such as that, you see all the further divisions. So when you visit China, you realize, well, those who speak Mandarin look down on those who speak Cantonese and vice versa, right? People identify by region, province, dialect, clan, religion. They identify in so many other ways uh, by their village and family. And that is first and foremost, not the sense of Asian and perhaps not even Chinese. So, when we look at this identity, uh, we realize that to be Asian is actually to make a statement. Asian is artificial. It is a coalition. It is an effort to say in America or here in Australia, we have common cause. The people our ancestors would have been at war with are people with whom we must find some common ground. We affiliate with them because we see that we have experiences here in the new world, once we've migrated, that give us a, a mutual a defense a pact, a reason to protect ourselves uh, against prejudice and stereotyping, to help one another break through the glass ceiling, or some have called it the bamboo ceiling. So people, from time to time, ask, they say, well, why do you have to identify that way with this ethnicity? Why can't you just, they ask me, be American? To which I say, that would be wonderful. I would be delighted. But I know that when my parents uh, came to the United States uh, from China via Taiwan in the 1950s, that they were called by many names, and American wasn't one of them. At best, they were oriental, that term vaguely connoting exoticism as if you belonged on the other side of the world. Or they were Chinese. Or they were called by slurs and epithets. You know, those words, chink and jap and goo and nip and words that were ugly, they were deemed to be yellow in the uh, scheme of uh, racial types that we have uh, in the US. And so when we say we are Asian, it is to affiliate. It is to say we will reach out and build bridges. And to say we are American is to proclaim not only to ourselves but to others that we are members of the body politic. We are not visitors, we are not tourists who forgot the camera back at the hotel room. We are not sojourners just passing through for fortune. No, we intend to settle, to stay, to be equals, to participate in the democratic process. So to be Asian American is to embrace something that our ancestors would have found most puzzling. The idea that you would be English speaking, for example, and one would hope that you would maintain a little bit of uh, a language that your grandparents uh, knew. Whenever I visit China, it's apparent to me my mother was right. I should have paid attention in Chinese school. 
So that is, in some sense, where it is I'm literally and figuratively coming from. I had to learn to be Asian American because uh, when I grew up, that term really hadn't come into use. It was, it was actually invented in 1968. There was a scholar, uh, someone who was Japanese American, who decided that uh, a new name was needed, and so he came up with this concept of Asian American. And when I was a kid, we were the only people who looked like us in the entire neighborhood. So that when I rode my bike around the block in the suburbs there in the Midwest, outside of Detroit, Michigan, I passed all the identical houses. That's what suburbs look like, right? There are only two or three designs, just a few variations. And inside uh, lived families that, so far as I could discern, were the same with a few variations, except us. We stood out in a time when difference was bad. This is an America which has uh, pursued a different course. We didn't have the word multiculturalism, diversity wasn't celebrated, but unlike Australia or Canada, the norm was to, to assimilate, to fit in, to as much as we could possibly mimic and copy our social superiors. We were expected to eat the same food, follow the same fashion, and yet, indelibly, the more we tried, the more ridiculous it seemed. We were always trying a little too hard, right? We always were struggling, always a little bit behind in whatever the fad was. I'm ashamed to admit this now, but when I was a kid growing up, I. I was always vaguely embarrassed of my own parents. Maybe this is true of some of you in this room. I was embarrassed of them because they had accents. And, well, they ate funny food. You know, like my dad always wanted me to eat some chicken feet. Uh, and when we watched television, they didn't quite laugh at the right time. They sometimes missed the joke. Uh, and even I, as a kid, could tell. If there was a dispute with the phone company, sometimes they would need my help to straighten that out because in that role reversal, I was their interpreter even though I was only a child. Maybe some of you have had an experience such as that. And I was also, to be honest, a little bit angry and resentful. I was angry with my parents because I figured it was their fault that I faced the teasing and taunting, the common cruelty of childhood, the bullying on the playground, as kids would challenge me just about every day to a karate match, you know, because they thought I was a kung fu expert. And I would go home and I would uh, tell my parents and they would scold me. They would say, you should try harder to fit in. See, what I didn't realize is uh, I thought my parents were blaming me. What I didn't realize is they sort of blamed themselves. Because when I was a kid, being a kid, I was naive. I thought, well, when I grew up, I wouldn't face any of this. This is just what kids did to one another. And I wanted to, to drive and shave and go off to work like my dad did as soon as I could, because I was sure that once I did that, I would be able to leave behind all of this prejudice that uh, haunted me on a daily basis. What I didn't know is that my parents faced it too. They faced the sophisticated adult version at work. And even when they went to the bank to try to take out a loan or when they went shopping, and there was nobody that they could complain to. And they had to, to hide this, to conceal it, to protect their children so as to pretend that nothing had happened. So I thought that my parents were blaming me, but in fact, they blamed themselves. You see, it was only when I was older that I realized my parents figured it was because of the accents, the funny food, because they, in fact, were from China that they faced all of this. They didn't realize that the prejudice was unwarranted, that it was wrong. They didn't speak the language of civil rights because they literally spoke another language. And I didn't speak the language of civil rights because I was a kid. My parents had faith in that American dream that they had learned from Hollywood movies. You know, in China, uh, people look at San Francisco as if it had a mountain of gold. And so when they migrated, they were sure that, well, even if they didn't quite fit in, that their children would, because we would speak English with no accent. We would be accepted automatically. 
So they didn't blame me at all. They blamed themselves for the prejudice that they couldn't put a name to, that they couldn't explain was uh, a shortcoming, that America, despite the ideals that they believed in so fervently, and I respect my parents. When I, I look at what they did, I could never match that, for they uh, traveled halfway around the world. They learned a new language. They put down roots, they succeeded, they prospered. For me to do the same, I would have to move to France and become a billionaire or something along those lines to achieve uh, what they had achieved and I took for granted. Yet so powerful was the yearning to belong. I knew that my uh, friends, the classmates who, the few who I became friends with, whose parents would allow them to play with me, that my friends' parents would never be my parents' friends, that we were isolated and the community that we could be a part of consisted only of people that they had known uh, in China or Taiwan, the handful who had migrated and would gather on Saturday nights for dinner parties, driving uh, all the way across uh, uh, a great distance in order uh, to be able to share food and gossip and be someplace where they felt at home, where they weren't different, where they weren't stigmatized. You know, my mother used to every afternoon spend uh, hours making a, a Chinese meal, five courses with a steamed whole fish. And my brothers and I, we would sit down uh, and even though we would scarf it down quite quickly, we would always complain. We wanted to, to uh, eat what our uh, uh, neighbors ate. And so we would demand hamburgers and hot dogs and pizza and you know even meatloaf, uh, not realizing uh, how much effort uh, my mother had put into uh, a traditional a Chinese meal and how difficult it was just to find the ingredients to be able to do that there in the Midwest in the United States. So I had to learn what it meant to be Asian American. I had to learn that because at school we weren't taught anything like that. We learned about the pilgrims who settled and um, Thanksgiving and uh, we learned about all the traditions of all the other groups. But when it came to Asians, when it came to Chinese, there was just one sentence in the high school history textbook that mentioned that some people built a railroad and that was about it. Now, that's all I knew. And so, uh, as far as I could tell, uh, we were the first, the only. And when you grow up like that, isolated, and this wasn't San Francisco, Chinatown, or New York City, uh, when you're isolated like that, you always figure that it's all in your head. That's what you're told, after all. The teachers at school, when I would complain about the teasing and taunting, they would say to me, just reply, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Even as a kid, I knew there was something a little wrong uh, with that phrase because the words, that's what leads to the sticks and stones. Those fighting words, the anger, the hatred, when people have a little bit too much to drink, when they're worried about whether they'll be laid off from their job, well, those words, when there's a mob, it pushes them over uh, the edge the modern version that we see today on social media with tweets, all of that falls along a spectrum. It's not just a joke. Well, it is to those who get to tell the joke. But for those who always are the butt of the joke, what was trivial to those who can laugh it off is traumatic to those who remember it years later. So, you know, when I was a kid, I could also tell that you know, kids, kids can get hurt in so many ways. They fall off a swing set, they knock their teeth out, they have high fevers, they tumble down the stairs, they, they recover. Actually, uh, when you're a kid, when, when you're a, a boy growing up, if you break a bone and get a plaster cast, that's great. Then you suddenly have street credibility, right? You're a tough guy. For six weeks, people want to sign the cast and, and uh, it makes you uh, really look like uh, you've done something uh, with your life. So the physical harm from the sticks and stones, that's actually, that's not so bad. As long as it's not too extreme, it's not fatal, it makes you tougher. But those words, those words, even today, if someone drives by and shouts at me, go back to where you came from, you chink, it's as if they've punched me in the gut. It takes me back in just that moment 
Maybe some of you have a memory like that. I don't mean to call up something that's painful for you, but you know what I'm talking about. You're just minding your own business, walking down the street. You're not thinking about race. You just need to run some errands, and maybe uh, there's a, a two cars that go for the same parking space at once, and it becomes a racial incident right then and there because the other person says, something about Asian drivers, right? Uh, and it calls up all of these stereotypes at all these moments, and right then you're reduced to the moment when you were five and you saw your parents face that too. And even though they were adults and you respected them and trusted them and depended on them, they were powerless against someone not actually even their equal, not educated as well, uh, uncouth, who with all those words and slurs and anger anger, demean them and diminish them to the point of nothingness. As if to say, it is not just you as an individual, it is your entire community, all of your kin, all of your people, you are nothing, you don't belong here. It is those moments that, well, we learned what it was like to be on the receiving end of all of this, but never to be the authors of our own destiny, to be the people who could declare what the standard was, who could set the example for others to follow. And we didn't appear in any of the histories, so it was that I had to learn what it meant to be Asian American. And here's how I learned. What brought everything together for me and what inspired me to become a lawyer was a, a case, a real case. I'm writing a book about this case. I've actually been working on this book all my life in some sense. It involved a, a murder, a, a brutal hate crime at a time when the term hate crime wasn't even really known to us. It's a person named Vincent Chin. That name almost certainly isn't known to you. There's no reason it would be. Some Asian Americans have heard of him. And in Detroit, my hometown, the Motor City, people know this case. But otherwise, he's an obscure figure. He's not even a martyr. He's not someone who set out to be a civil rights icon. But I'll just take a moment to tell you about this case, because it's why I became a lawyer. And I'll wager, for those of you in this room, you have a case like this that that's why you wanted to pursue justice. There was a wrong that had to be righted. So Vincent Chin was a 27-year-old Chinese American. I didn't know him, I didn't know his family, but in 1982 in Detroit, that's so long ago that uh, it's important to set the scene. You know, for students today, I realize 1982 may as well have been 1882. You know, it's, it's pre-web, pre-personal computer. The latest technology was the fax machine and the compact disc, all right? So to put this into perspective, in the States, we had three television channels. I don't know how many you had here, but that was it. This is before streaming, before cable. MTV had just come out, and that was the latest thing, music videos. Uh, but most importantly for this story, um, to set the stage, the United States was in the throes of, was just coming out of in the 70s and 80s, a terrible recession, even worse than what we've experienced now, because that recession, interest rates were in the double digits, unemployment uh, as well, but it wasn't global, not like 2008. That recession was just the United States, you see, and just certain parts of the United States, such as my hometown, Detroit. And it was when Japan was going to take over the world. Do you, do you remember that? Uh, it's almost quaint now, given that uh, Japan <laughs> crashed that bubble uh, then, and it's never uh, uh, risen uh, to that same level. But do you remember that? In, in the US, the Japanese were said to be uh, buying uh, the whole country. They were buying national landmarks, sports teams. They were buying parts of American culture. People called it a economic Pearl Harbor, referring to the Dece December 7th, 1941 uh, bombing uh, that uh, drew the US into World War II. They talked about the rise of the East, the decline of the West. People wrote books predicting that everyone would soon be answering to a Japanese boss. Right? So this is part of this background. And Detroit in particular, I need to tell you a little bit about 
where I'm from, where I'm really from, Detroit, the Motor City. Some of you may know because uh, it's where, if you like music, the Motown sound uh, came from in the 1960s. It was once the fourth largest city in the United States. It's where modern manufacturing was invented. Factories that would produce, uh, Henry Ford uh, had them uh, make the Model T car. And what was once a luxury good, suddenly you could be working uh, there in one of the plants and you could save enough money, even as an unskilled laborer. He paid the princely sum of $5 per day to any man who would toil and sweat uh, in his factories a hundred years ago. And so it was that Detroit was the home of the blue collar middle class. You could be working class and yet make enough money not just to buy your own house and car, but to buy a, a little cabin up north to hunt and fish. You could be a dropout from high school, go into a factory at the age of 17, retire 30 years later at 47 with that pension and health care. So all of that though, was challenged because, and this is the last piece of this story before of setting the stage before I tell you what happened to this fellow Vincent Chin. Because Detroit is where cars were made. That's why I grew up there. My father worked at Ford Motor Company. And it was once the Silicon Valley of its day. It's hard to believe that because it's a magnificent wreck now. It's a place where in the United States, if you mention it, people feel sorry that that's where you grew up. <clears throat> And if it's known to you at all, you know of it as a city fallen on hard times. It's part of the American Rust Belt. Everything bad that happened in the United States in the past 50 years happened first there. Race riots, suburban sprawl, what's called white flight as people moved outward and abandoned the, the, the core. Uh, it uh, is a place where factories started to close and entire blocks uh, were uh, left forlorn with the homes being burned for arson. So it's with this backdrop, as the Japanese cars, imported cars started to come, Detroit was hit hard. And here too, kids uh, don't remember, but there was a time, I'll bet this is true in Australia as well, though less so, when people didn't drive Japanese cars. They were cheap, they were small, people called them Jap crap, right? And, and uh, those funny cars with the weird names people couldn't pronounce, Honda, Subaru, Toyota, they became popular when oil rocketed upward in price. Some of you in this room remember, uh, in the US, gas was so expensive it was rationed on, on some days. You couldn't even buy it, and you had to line up for hours to fill your tank. All right, let me turn back to this story. 1982, Detroit. So Vincent Chin, he was just a guy, an ordinary guy, Chinese-American. Salt of the earth. He wasn't the model minority. He was not the whiz kid rocket scientist overachiever. He dropped out of college. He worked as a waiter. So uh, he was uh, just a guy who hung out with his pals. Uh, maybe he drove too fast and, and drank too much. And that's okay. That's part of the story. He was normal. As the defense lawyers in the case would say, he was no different than those who killed him. And that's true. If he had been white, he would have been a good old boy, a redneck. But he was different in color of skin, the texture of hair, the shape of his eyes. So Chin <coughs> was about to be married. He found a nice young lady, also of Chinese background, also working class. These weren't rich people. And he did what anyone else would do, any other guy. He went out with some buddies of his for a bachelor's party in Detroit in 1982. They went to a seedy part of town, run down, part of town where the only businesses left were strip clubs and, and bars like that. And so, because that's what guys do when they're going to celebrate for one last night uh, before they, they tie the knot. So uh, at this bar that he went to, he and his buddies are having a good time, enjoying themselves, as you would expect anyone else like him to be doing. Again, 27 years old, Chinese American. And across the stage, there were two other gentlemen. It's a father and a stepson, auto workers, white. And they looked over at Chin, and they started, according to witnesses, to use those racial slurs, the ones I remember well, chink, 
Jap, Nip, they called him. You hardly even hear that term anymore. And then one of them, even though Chin said, I'm Chinese, not Japanese, and of course he was an American, and doing no better than those who, who uh, would beat him. Uh, one of them said, you'll have to pardon the language, but the witnesses said that one of those two gentlemen looked at Chin and said, you little motherfucker, it's because of you motherfuckers that were out of work. One of them was an out of work auto worker. One was a supervisor, but they both worked in, in the, the factories. They made cars. And what ensued afterward, well, this much is certain. After the sun had set on a fine summer's day there in Motown, off of Woodward Avenue, the major thoroughfare that ran from the city center all the way outward, using a baseball bat they had in the trunk of their car, these two gentlemen bludgeoned Chin to death. They cracked his skull open, literally, so that blood and spinal fluid and cerebral matter pooled onto the pavement beneath him, and he crumpled, uttering the words, last words, it's not fair. The emergency medical tech who showed up on the scene as the first responder said, nobody survives a head wound like that. He was in a coma, he lingered for a few days, never recovered consciousness, and so his family said that the plug should be pulled. And the guests who would have attended his wedding went to his funeral instead. So Vincent Chin was killed, why? Because to his attackers he represented Tokyo and Toyota. It was because of him. They blamed him for their economic woes. Never mind that he was Chinese, not Japanese, an American, not a foreigner. We all look alike. This was mistaken identity twice over. Sober, cleaned up, dressed in their Sunday best, the two who killed Chin uh, appeared uh, f prior to their trial. They took a plea deal. And uh, Detroit being the murder capital of the US back then, the prosecutors didn't show up because they cut a deal. The two agreed to plead to manslaughter. And they were smart. Never once did they deny that they had killed Chin. They couldn't very well have done so. There were dozens of witnesses who saw the brutal beating. And this wasn't a shooting. This was using their own muscles and this bat. They really had to put some force in, into what they were doing. But here's what they said, and you're all lawyers and judges and law students in the room. They said that there was no mens rea, that this was just a bar brawl that got out of hand. Yes, they admitted the actus rea, the act of killing, but they said no. It, they, they were not bigots, they were just guys. This just, it just happened. And the story they told is that for no apparent reason, this fellow, this Oriental fellow Chin, just came over and wanted to fight with them. Well, the judge, not having heard any of the evidence because of the plea deal, the evidence would come out later, not having heard any of the evidence about chink, jap, nip, about you little motherfuckers, because you were out of work, sentenced the two killers of Vincent Chin to probation for three years and a fine of $3,000. This single incident was a catalyst. Never before had people paid attention to any case involving a single Asian American the way they did to this, nor have they since. In the book that I'm writing, I'm going to claim that before the Vincent Chin case, there really weren't Asian Americans. That term just hadn't caught on yet. Maybe academic sociologists would have used it, but ordinary people, they wouldn't have recognized that word. They would have said, what, what do you mean, Asian American? It would be an oxymoron. But Asian Americans did something that no one had seen before then. They organized, they marched, they protested, they gave speeches, they wrote letters to the editor of newspapers. They did everything that African Americans and others had done before them, demanding justice for Vincent Chin. They formed a group, American Citizens for Justice. 
they chose that name very deliberately because they wanted people to know this was about Americans. That Chin was an American, that they were too, we were too. I was there as a teenager for just a little bit of this. And they said every speech, every pamphlet had to be in English because they wanted to ensure that no one had any doubt about who they were. They also were worried that if they allowed anything in Chinese, there'd be fights over what dialect and whether to have traditional characters or simplified, and then all these politics would come into it. There's much more to this story. We don't have time uh, for me to share it with you now. But suffice it to say, this case, it explained everything for me. Before this case, well, I wanted to be an architect, and if you talked to me about ethnicity or any of these issues, I wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with it. The last thing I wanted to do was admit that I was of Chinese descent and to deal with any of this, right? When you're a kid growing up, you want to be normal. You, you want to be just like the other kids, to be accepted. You want nothing more than, well, to be able to just be yourself. You don't want to be identified by some label put into a box. And because America wanted us to assimilate and we wanted to deny that there was anything that detracted from the American dream, we wouldn't have wanted to, to confront these issues until the Chin case, because that made it apparent it was inevitable. You had no choice, because here everything came together, and it was all explained, because now suddenly I realized it wasn't just me, that I wasn't just hypersensitive, thin-skinned, politically correct, that to care about these issues, well, there was a reason, because these words, they weren't just words. They could lead to much, much worse. But I was given hope because I saw that through rhetoric, you could use words positively too. You could persuade people who didn't look like you, didn't agree with you, that to kill someone and to receive probation, there's something not quite right about that. And so this protest about the Vincent Chin killing, it enlisted eventually not just Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, but it uh, attracted the support of blacks, Hispanics, Catholics, Jews, women's groups, labor unions, just ordinary folks as uh, the uh, multiple trials went on because they all understood that you didn't have to be of Chinese descent, you didn't have to be of Asian ancestry to be outraged that uh, for this killing, which the perpetrators never denied, that probation somehow didn't seem right. That if the roles had been reversed or if some people who were black bludgeoned to death someone who was white, the likelihood that they would have received so lenient a sentence was just about nil. So it wasn't just me. When you talk to others who are Asian American, who call themselves by that name, those who are lawyers, uh, who are about my age or older, they will tell you the reason they went to law school was because of the Vincent Chin case. This case explained for them finally what had been a mystery, the themes of the Asian American experience, and there are two that I'll touch upon uh, that run through uh, US law. One is the sense of being a perpetual foreigner, that even if you're a sixth generation Californian, and there are now people of Asian descent who are sixth generation Californians, their great, great grandparents came before the state was a state admitted to the union. That nonetheless, you're thought of as a spy, a saboteur, disloyal, a sleeper agent waiting to rise up uh, to answer Beijing or Tokyo or who knows uh, what. It's this sense that even when you're asked where are you from and you reply, people want to know where are you really from, a question they don't ask of others and don't expect to be asked of them. There's nothing wrong with being from China. My parents are from China. The problem with this question is it denies one's autonomy, that I can be who I say I am. It's selective, and it often leads to 
the Chin case. We've had enough experience when we answer the question. It turns out people have not only placed us in their geography of race, they want to enact some sort of resentment that they have about the uh, ancestral homeland that they imagine uh, we are still a part of. This perpetual foreigner syndrome explains the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the internment of Japanese Americans, a pair of United States Supreme Court cases that hardly anyone, even constitutional scholars uh, knows about. Uh, you know that there was white Australia. Canadians know that there was a Canadian version. Very f few people know that the United States had a policy like that, too. In 1922 and 1923, first someone of Japanese descent, then someone who's South Asian, went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court to naturalize. They both lost. They lost because the statute on the books then said you could naturalize only if you were a free white person. It was amended uh, to allow you to naturalize if you were of African nativity or descent. But for a couple of generations, people of Asian background were aliens ineligible to citizenship. They could not even if they had come legally, even if they had assimilated, even if they were English speaking, even if they were Christian, they could not legally become members of the body politic. That's the perpetual foreigner syndrome, the sense that if you're Vincent Chin, Chinese, Japanese, what's the difference? You still represent Tokyo and Toyota. The other theme is the model minority myth. It's the uh, seeming compliment, oh, you Asians, you're all doing so well. You're uh, overachievers. When you think about that word, what does it mean? It means you're getting something more than you deserve. Sometimes I explain to folks there's something troubling about this concept, and they say, what's wrong with you? Why are you complaining? We're saying you're smart and hardworking. You know, people sometimes ask me to come over and help uh, uh, fix their, their laptop because you Asians, you're all so good with, with that sort of thing. It makes me want to go over and wipe out their hard drive. Um, <laughs> not, not, not because uh, uh, I'm rude, but because this is a stereotype and it's dangerous. Let me explain how uh, it's dangerous. You know, when people say, oh, you Asians, you're all so polite. What is it they're really saying? They're saying you keep to your place. You know not to fuss. Well, this notion that Asian Americans are smart and hardworking can be turned on its head. The Asians throughout US history and throughout Australian history, we've been punished not for our vices, but for our virtues. What is it to be hardworking? It's to be unfair competition. What is it to be good at math and science? It's to be soulless, an automaton, to really lack people skills, to not be warm, not be a leader, right? And so all of these traits that at first blush, it looks like it's a compliment. When you go beneath the surface, you realize that this is why uh, people uh, agitate and say, we can't compete against these Asians. They study all the time, you know? Uh, and it harkens back to all of the language from the exclusion period. There was an American labor leader named Samuel Gompers who wrote a famous pamphlet. He would, it was actually a very progressive labor leader. He wrote a pamphlet entitled, Meat Versus Rice. And you would have to read this to believe it. You can Google it, you can look at it for yourself. Gompers argued, this is at the turn of the century, in the early 19 aughts, he argued, white people need to eat meat. But Asiatics, Orientals, subsist on rice. And this is unfair because for the white working man, you have to buy meat. And if you're Asian, you don't have to eat meat. So Asian people always outcompete whites. So understand what he's saying. <laughs> he's saying that Asians are too good and have to be kept out. That's the model minority myth. It's also used to attack other people of color, to hold up Asians as an example and say, look at the Asians. They made it. Why can't you? You know, when I was a kid, uh, my parents would sometimes say to me, you know, they would compare me to 
my, uh, to their, their friends' kids. Maybe you, you had parents who did this. My parents would say, why can't you be more like so-and-so, son? You know, it'd make me want to go over and punch that kid in the nose, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Which is a normal response. In Australia, you call it uh, the tall poppy syndrome, right? If one person is held up or one racial group is held up as an example, what does that lead to? Resentment, envy, anger wanting to go punch them in the nose. That's in part what the Chin case is about too. It's about out of work auto workers struggling who are right to be angry, but who do they blame? Someone who's an Asian American guy minding his own business, having a good time, about to be married, who's got nothing to do with their economic woes and who's in no better situation than they are except people think, oh Asians, you're all wealthy, right? And you could just go back to where you came from if you don't like it here. When people say that to me, I say, well, it's not that much better in Detroit. So <laughs> this case captured these recurring themes of the Asian American experience. And it explained for so many of us who otherwise had no way of comprehending uh, all of these issues, what it was uh, that was happening to us. So I went off uh, to college and decided that I wanted to be a lawyer and a civil rights activist, and that's the work that I've continued to do. I'm gonna close with one last story and then uh, take your uh, questions. Uh, one last st story uh, to uh, offer the law professor stock and trade. I'm going to make an analogy uh, between diversity and democracy. Here's why I'm going to do that, because I have many friends, good friends, who talk to me about these issues, and, and they, they say the following. They say, well, I, I marched. And they remember being in the hot sun in Washington, D.C. with Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 when he gave his I Have a Dream speech. It's funny how many people remember that, even people too young to have possibly been there at the time. <laughs> no one says they threw tomatoes or rocks or did much worse. Everyone remembers having been on the side of right and social justice. Well, I'll take them at their word because uh, there's a phenomenon. Maybe you've seen this too. For many of my friends who talk about how they, they believe, they then say, but that was then, this is now. And they want to know how come we still have these issues. They have to go to diversity training. They're resentful of that. Uh, why do we have uh, programs to help people, uh, to help them succeed if they come from disadvantaged backgrounds? They're sure that they are the victim of reverse bias now. And uh, they demand to know how come uh, real Americans aren't uh, getting all of these benefits. Do you know the sentiment, right? It's people who, <clears throat> they, they tell me, they say, I'm just sick and tired of hearing about other people's problems. It makes me wonder if they're sick and tired of hearing about the problems, what they think it must be like to live with those problems. You know, there was an activist uh, in the US in the 1960s during this era, Fannie Lou Hamer, a name uh, that few know, but she had a famous line. She said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So for so many in the States now, what they yearn for is closure. They want to say, well, we passed civil rights statutes, we're done. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of this anymore. And they ask me, they say, when does it end, all this diversity talk, this nonsense? When is it over? And I always reply, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to end. I don't think it should be over. And they shake their heads and they say to me, oh, you're such a pessimist. You're really cynical. You think that we have to contend with these issues and our children and their children too, although the events of the past few weeks in the United States I think have made clear that yes, we do have to contend with these issues, that they are not part of the past, they are not about some other generation or some other place. These are issues of today and they're not just theoretical or academic or historical, uh, they lead to real violence and to death and to uh, just the fracturing of a nation that once was looked to as a beacon of hope and opportunity the world over. But when my friends, when they say, when is it 
over. It's almost as if they're pleading. They wish to wash their hands of this matter and to say, we've done all that we can do. Let's never talk about this again. You know, they never want to talk about women's issues or LGBT issues or whatever else. They've just had enough, right? You know what I'm talking about? They're sort of fed up, right? So I explained to my friends, you know, I don't think it will be over because I'm an optimist, not a pessimist. Let me explain. Maybe diversity is like democracy. So here's the law professor part. Maybe it's analogous. It's a process, not an outcome. It's not a product you can buy. It's not a project you can complete. It's a process that you engage in that calls upon you to roll up your sleeves, to march, rest your weary feet, and march again. That uh, it's about rights and responsibilities. This is a way in which Australia is better than uh, my, my uh, homeland, which is you have compulsory voting. You recognize that you must participate, that if you don't, everything falls apart. Think of uh, it this way. When you go to the polling place to cast your ballot, to exercise that right, fulfill that responsibility, and this isn't partisan, it doesn't matter who you voted for, what party you support, which candidate, and so on. But if the man or woman uh, in front of you turns to you and said, elections again, when does this end? When is it over? If they complain mightily that this democracy thing had been going on and on and on, and you know, when, when would you finally not have to do it anymore, you would realize, hmm, this person missed an important civics class in high school. They, they sort of don't get the point. The point is it's a process. We, uh, these nations of the new world are experiments in self-governance, unknown previously in human history and in so much of the world lacking even today. This opportunity when we entertain visitors uh, from China, sometimes they're puzzled and they ask, how it can be that we get to choose our own leaders? How uh, can it be that, that people run for office with slogans and ideas and they contend with each other? And that is what we celebrate. This is why people want to be part of Australia and part of America, because here we control our destinies as they do not elsewhere. So maybe diversity is like democracy. It's a process, not an outcome. It demands of us that we engage and participate because that is the only way to make good on its ideals. T to close, it is an honor to be here speaking with you. I hope that I've shared a story or two, all of them true, that causes you to remember the story that you have to tell. Every individual, every community has a case like the Vincent Chin case. And even though justice was not done there, by writing the narrative, we can right the wrongs. We can reclaim for ourselves a story that needs to be told and celebrated, not pushed aside because the margins are making the new mainstream. Australia and America are both changing faster than you can possibly imagine. When you look at the uh, trams here and who is riding them and uh, what accents uh, you hear, you realize that Australia, like America, that we are already diverse and we are still a democracy and there are those who are frightened by both prospects but I'm convinced that those ideals are mutually reinforcing. To be diverse makes you a better democracy. To be a democracy makes you diverse and that ultimately is what this project is about for all of us. This opportunity to claim our own space, to put down our roots, to say who we are, and to achieve ideals of diversity and democracy by working together. Thank you so much. I think we're uh, taking a few questions. Yes. Thank you, Professor Wu, for an inspiring speech.
Um, it's been an honour to hear your story and your message about cultural diversity. The professors very kindly agreed to take some questions from the floor for the next 10 minutes or so um, from here and also from our friends in uh, Perth, uh, the Western Australian branch of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. Um, you'll see um, Amelia and Maddie walking around with roving mics, so please wait until they arrive with their microphone before you ask your question. I think I saw a hand over there. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about a comment. So I've talked to lots of people about cultural diversity, um, particularly in the legal profession, and it sort of relates back to this idea of diversity as a process and the change in society. So what you get when you speak to senior people in the legal profession is actually, you know, we're seeing in emission ceremonies around Australia, there's lots of Asian it's coming through, being admitted to law. So it's just a matter of time. You just have to wait. You don't have to do anything. It's automatically going to change. And I just wondered, is that the same in America? And then what is your response to that? Yes, right. So people say that all the time. Oh, you know, every group went through this. Don't worry, right? Uh, I'm skeptical because no change is automatic. It all comes through struggle. Uh, in the United States, one way to think about this is significant numbers of Chinese started to arrive in the 1830s. Significant numbers of Irish started to arrive at that time as well. Yet today, when you look at people of Chinese descent, or Asian descent more generally, that change hasn't been automatic. So people assume, and this is part of the prejudice, that we're all in that pejorative phrase, fresh off the boat. Oh, don't worry, you know. Not realizing that actually the Asian presence in the United States, like the Asian presence in Australia, goes back already 150 years. So in the United States Civil War, if you look at the rosters of the Union and Confederate armies, there were Chinese soldiers on both sides. That sounds like an astonishing proposition, but it's true. So if we follow that advice and just wait. We'll be waiting for another 150 years. We'll just be sitting and waiting. Part of the reason is, I'm going to give you two additional answers, is first, and everything in the United States has changed in the past year. So when I was giving speeches a, a year ago, I would say, look, we have a consensus now that racial discrimination, overt, egregious, in your face, open prejudice, that that's wrong. So a year ago, I said things such as you can't run for political office and be a bigot. You, you can't uh, head a law firm, you can't head a corporation, you can't be a university chancellor, you, you just can't. Um, but now this overt version of prejudice has resurfaced. I mean, it's just open people saying America is for whites and whites only, you know, an ethnic nationalist claim. But there's something else. So I'm dedicated to, to fighting that. That is a challenge, this resurgence that we see of explicit bias, not disguise at all. And, and I, I'm going to say something that might sound a little perverse. I actually think it's good that it's in the open, right? That it's not hidden. Because now we can see it, right? You can't deny it. <laughs> because part of the challenge in the past few years is some people just deny it. They say, nah, nah, that, that doesn't exist anymore, right? Well, no one is going to say it doesn't exist anymore because it does, because it's in the newspaper headlines on, on a daily basis. So it's right out there. But part of the challenge is that's not all there is to it. There's also the unconscious, the implicit, the subtle, where among polite people, they'll assure you, I'm no bigot, <laughs> right? Uh, yet it turns out that they consistently expect uh, the junior female at the meeting to pour the coffee, right? They mistake the barrister for the criminal defendant when they're a person of color, right? Um, 
that when you look at these little subtle moments, and you can't with any one of them say that was an act of hatred. No, because every one of them is ambiguous, right? But when you add it up and you have enough examples and you realize, huh, this keeps recurring, something's going on, and, and we're all guilty, I am no different than anyone else. We have these images rattling around in the backs of our heads, right, that uh, tell us when we walk down the street who is safe and who is to be avoided as potentially dangerous, right? So there's also this subtle bias, and that's in part the Chin case is about that too. So one of the things that uh, the defense lawyers argued is our clients are not members of the Ku Klux Klan. They're not neo-Nazis, they're not skinheads. They used the terms that were being used then. They said they're, they're not bigots that way. I'm actually prepared to accept that. They didn't go out looking to kill someone Asian American that night, but as one of the defendants said, he just snapped, right? And to some extent, that's a little scarier to me. It's a little scarier because I'll, I'll give you an Australian example. You know, if, if I have to avoid someone um, such as Pauline Hansen, okay, I, I can structure my life to do that, right? Or I can try. But if it turns out it could be the next guy or gal at the bar uh, where I'm having a drink or at the bar in court or the next person waiting for a tram who, if pushed just a little bit, will suddenly reveal, right, uh, that they have this bias. That, to some extent, is even more disturbing to me than, than what's open and clear, because when, when it's clear, you can deal with it. The second answer that, that I'll give briefly is this. There's another issue, and it's beyond the scope of what we have time for today, but I think it is just important to acknowledge. There is a germ of truth to many stereotypes. It's exaggerated and distorted, but there's a little germ of truth to some of them. And for people of Asian descent, I sometimes worry that uh, we have uh, internalized some strategies that might have made sense in Asia where it fits within a culture, but that's exemplified by, I'll give you two, two proverbs. There's a Japanese and a Chinese version. Oh, just about every East Asian culture has this. The Japanese version is, the nail that sticks up is pounded down. Okay? The Chinese say, the loudest duck is shot first by the hunter. Now, what is this about? This is about not making a fuss, not standing up and speaking up. It's about deference to one's elders, fidelity to tradition. It's about blending in, being innocuous. It's about saving face. It's about not rocking the boat, however you want to describe it. And if you're going to be successful as a solicitor or barrister, and your goal is to be inoffensive, I would suggest to you you're not going to get very far, that that is not what makes you an effective advocate and counselor. So I sometimes worry that many of us were raised in traditions where our parents shushed us, you know? We weren't expected to speak until spoken to. We were never to contradict anyone in public who was senior to us, and so on. And we're a little too polite for our own good. One of the things that happens to me after I speak is people of Asian descent will, will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I think I'm facing discrimination at, at work. And they'll, they'll tell me their story. And I'll say to them, yeah, you're facing discrimination. You should probably hire a lawyer to deal with this. And they'll say, oh, no. We Asians, we, we don't do that. And I want to say, what's wrong with you? you you're facing bias, you're, you're concerned enough to, to come tell me, and when I explain to you that there is a remedy, you don't want to pursue it, um, and that is just condemning you and others like you to never see that change. So some of this is on us, as, as kids now would say. And for many Asians, there's a denial. Uh, I can't tell you how many people of Asian descent I talk to who say, oh, I've never experienced bias. No, no. It never happened to me. I, I've, I've heard of these things you talk about. But then once you get to know them, you realize, wait a minute. It happens to them all the time, and, and they've 
just somehow constructed their lives. It's a, it's a coping mechanism, I, I understand, but they've constructed their lives so that, that they can deny it to themselves. That worries me every bit as much uh, as those who would not allow us to flourish, which is that we are inhibited ourselves. It's probably time for just one more. Um, I think that man had his hand up first. Just wait one moment. <laughs> It's a, a very personal topic, so one has to relate in the personal sense, and I'd like to relate back to the previous uh, speaker. Uh, I came to Australia 20 years before you first visited this place. Australia was a normal place. At that, place, at that time, it was white Australia, at the tail end of it. And as almost the only Chinese around, it's very welcomed. No one was dis discriminating against me. Right? And there were processes in place. If there's any complaint, it worked. And what's my experience now, after 50 years, 50 odd years? It's getting worse year by year by year by year by year. And it's getting worse now because we're having hard times now. It's not as bad as Detroit, but it's coming. All right? and, uh, Yes, because I've been here earlier. I'm fortunate I can protect myself. But the setting is entirely different from uh, um, our esteemed colleague here. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, there's an important concept, the tipping point. And the social scientists who study this will tell you, uh, in neighborhoods in the US, it's probably true here, neighborhoods that are all white, you actually if you're one lone family, can sometimes move in. It's only when you reach critical mass and it tips. And the exact proportion, it varies. But 10%, 20%, suddenly, they were tolerant before. Why? Because you're just one. You're a curiosity. You're harmless. You know, it, isn't that interesting? We have a Chinaman here. You know, yeah. tell us about China. So, so you can perform your ethnicity and that's oh, harmless, right? But then you have children. Oh, now they're breeding, you know, and, and, and then a busload of tourists arrive and suddenly look at how many there are, you know, and this is the yellow peril. And in part, it's coupled to something else that's happened within our lifetimes. It's just a fact of life. China has risen. China is Australia's most important trading partner. It doesn't matter if you're of Chinese descent. It doesn't matter uh, liberal, labor, greens. You know, Australia is dependent on China in many ways. And China is going to drive economic growth or its lack thereof in Australia. So part of what we have to do is adapt and adjust. And I'll close with just one final note. Um, some of my friends, I'll share with you something very personal that I hope will make you laugh a little bit. So some of my friends who are white in the US, do you know what they say to me? They say, when China is dominant, it's going to be great for you. You're going to be all set. And I say, what? Are you insane? If China takes over, it means every bet my family has made for three generations is wrong. You know, <laughs> my, my grandparents fought the communists. My parents moved uh, to Taiwan and then to the US. And I'm assimilated. You know, it, I'm really going to have a hard time. I'm going to have a harder time than you, my Anglo friend. Here's why. What, what, when I visit China and, and I speak Mandarin, people pull me aside, they shake their, they say, oh, don't speak Mandarin anymore. It, <laughs> it's, it's painful for, for, for us. And, and they say, you should be embarrassed, you know? And then my white friend shows up and says, ni hao, and they're like, oh, you're fluent, you know? It's like, ah, oh, geez, I cannot win here, you know? Um, so for many of us who are Asian, American, Asian, Australian, 
we made a commitment. We traveled across the Pacific. We're here to stay. And I'm not kidding when I say my mother was right. I should have paid attention in Chinese school. Thanks to YouTube, in the morning as I'm brushing my teeth, I listen to and watch videos of <laughs> Mandarin so that I can brush up on Mandarin. Uh, but I realize that whenever I visit China, I realize, yes, I am Chinese in some sense, right? Uh, I, uh, that's comfort food for me is Chinese food. But when I walk down the street, there's no mistaking me. I'm not a Chinese Chinese person. I'm a Chinese American. I walk like an American. I talk like an American. I think like a kid from Detroit. Now, I can't help it. I can't unwind this history and go back. But what I can do, and what we can all do, is build bridges. Because there's so much that can be gained from cooperation rather than conflict. That, those are my final thoughts. And I believe uh, we have food and drink. Thank you again so much. A delight to be in Melbourne.